creators with interest in uh, technology. Uh, we try to present you experiences in technology. We recently presented a webinar on uh, virtual reality. And this webinar on 3D printing will be of great interest. In a nutshell, this very promising technology is going to invade our world. So get ready. Next. Uh, I will be moderating uh, this webinar with uh, Rémi Acosta. I am Jacqueline Surug. I am the chair of the FIP Technology Forum. I just finished my mandate as a, a vice president of FIP, and I am a, a, a former a president of the hospital uh, section of FIP. I, am a, I have a hospital background, and I am working in a hospital in the city of Niort in France. And I am happy to uh, introduce you to Rémi, uh, Rémi Acosta. I think many of you know him already. He's also a member of the FIP Technology Forum. He's uh, um, the secretary of the FIP Community Pharmacy section. He's a community pharmacist and pharmacy owner in Spain. And on FIP level, he's also part of the expert advisory group for COVID-19. Before handing over to Jaime, next. I would uh, like to make some announcements. Um, this, this webinar is being recorded and live streamed via YouTube. The recording will be available on our website and you see here the uh, link to go uh, as a replay to this uh, webinar. It will be put on the website some, just after the session. You may ask questions and we ask you to uh, use the question box, which is provided. And you are welcome to provide feedback after the session. Feedback is important. We encourage you to, uh, to do so because it uh, helps us to uh, improve our webinars. And if you are not yet a member of FIP, uh, please consider to, to join us. Uh, there is a link here that will uh, uh, lead you directly to the membership registration. So after all that, I hand it over to you, uh, Jaime. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction. A uh, super big welcome to all of you from uh, all the uh, corners of the world to this uh, webinar about 3D printing. So uh, we would like to uh, have a, a view on how 3D printing is going to revolutionize pharmacy practice, not only in community pharmacy, but also hospital pharmacy. And we have an excellent panel of speakers who are actually pushing the boundaries of the pharmacy profession forward. So I'm very honored to have them here with us today. So we will talk about uh, how 3D printing is going to revolutionize the production of, production of pharmaceuticals. Uh, how it's going to offer, and it's offering already, a uh, uh, flexible drug product manufacturing platform that can adapt readily to changing market and patient needs. And we'll have a very special presentation from our second speaker on that. Uh, we will talk and discuss, uh, and I hope it's interactive and you use the Q&A box as uh, kindly suggested by uh, Jacqueline. When will a pharmacist be able to use each patient's individual information to produce their optimal medication dose? And when it's going to be the time when pharmacies will be able to not only print drugs uh, in our, our practice setting, but I think more importantly, when will patients be able to print their medicines at home? And you can see that this is a very challenging question that will be answered by our three speakers. So uh, in the next slide, please. These are the learning objectives for today, and I hope that we covered them all. I'm sure we will cover them all. Describe the generalities related to 3D printing of medicines, understand the opportunities, issues, and regulation related to 3D printing of medicines, learn how different technological tools allow personalized 3D printed medicines, and outline, um, it's singular there, but we'll actually have a few uh, practical experiences in 3D printing in pharmacies, not only community pharmacy, but also hospital pharmacy. In the next slide, please, we um, have our overview for today, opening and welcome, introduction, 
the 3D printing of pharmaceuticals. When will it arrive at the homes of patients? Uh, by Alvaro Goyanes, Goyanes, who I will introduce now. Personalized decision making for a personalized uh, three medicine by Mr. Patrick Van Orschot. Sorry for my pronunciation. And last but not, not least, uh, bringing 3D printing to pharmacy by Mr. Jan uh, Sables. We'll have a panel discussion, which I'm sure will be super interesting with your questions. And we'll have a, a short wrap up with a few conclusions uh, from us, uh, Jacqueline and me. So in the next slide, uh, let me please uh, have the honor of introducing you to uh, Dr. Alvaro Goyanes, who is uh, co-founder and development director of FabRx, the first company focused on developing 3D printing technology for fabrication of personalized medicines and medical devices. He is also an honorary lecturer at University College London School of Pharmacy in the UK and part-time lecturer at the Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Alvaro is one of the first researchers to evaluate the opportunities of 3D printing using new 3D printing technologies to manufacture oral dosage forms and medical devices. Alvaro has published already, and it's counting, more than 70 articles he has listed amongst the world's most highly influential researchers in 2019 and 2020 by Web of Science, and he's a recognized world expert in 3D printing of medicines with more than 100 communications to international conferences. He holds a PhD in pharmaceutics from the University of Santiago de Compostela in Spain, and he has worked for three years as a registered pharmacist thus has first-hand knowledge of the needs in terms of medicines in the community pharmacy. Lastly, uh, I would encourage you to follow all our three speakers on their uh, different uh, social media networks at which they very generously uh, share um, very valuable information. Lastly, one article I saw this very uh, morning from Alvaro Goyanes, who is very much related, of course, to the content of today. Super interesting. Thank you, Alvaro. The floor is yours. Well, um, thank you, Jaime, for the for your kind introduction. It's a bit embarrassed for me. Um, I, I, first of all, I, I would like to thank uh, Jaime and Jacqueline uh, the invitation and, and all of the orga organizers the, the invitation to to be here and to show uh, the work we do uh, related to three D printing. Um, the, the title of uh, the conference of my presentation was suggested by Jaime and is 3D printing of pharmaceuticals. When will it arrive at the home of the patients? Well, uh, obviously I don't know the answer, but uh, I, I think many researchers and many professionals we are working to make uh, the pharmaceutical products uh, and to, to have these uh, products, these medicines closer to the patients. Uh, there are some needs for these patients to have the right uh, medicines. Uh, and we think that 3D printing is a, a tool, a new tool that can help uh, pharmacists all around the world to get better medicines for patients. And this is what I'm going to show today and explain a bit uh, briefly about uh, 3D printing. So I suppose most of you know what 3D printing is, but basically 3D printing is a technology that allows us to have a digital design in a computer, uh, send this digital design to a, a equipment, a piece of equipment that is the 3D printer, and then uh, just selecting some parameters, getting uh, this digital design converted in an object. Uh, right now, it's possible to print many different types of materials, uh, concrete to make uh, houses or castles, uh, plastic to make uh, small models, metal to make cars. It's possible to print cells. It's possible to print many different types of materials, glass, uh, gold, copper, uh, whatever material you, you think about is possible to print them. But uh, we are going to focus on medical applications here. Uh, in, the, in 3D printing, uh, the medical field uh, was moved a lot thanks to 3D printing. Right now, uh, a hot topic is bioprinting because we are uh, able to print uh, tissues. So 3D print uh, cells and layer of cells to print uh, tissue and in the future organs. Uh, it's possible to print prosthetics like hearing aids. Nowadays, I think 95% of the hearing aids are produced custom made to the patient using uh, 3D printing. In dentistry, it's possible to print uh, this uh, Invisalign, this 
flexible uh, brackets, so to, to align the teeth perfectly. And uh, I'm going to focus mainly on 3D printing of tablets uh, that we call printlets that are personalized medicines or, or just simple medicines that can be uh, 3D printed instead of uh, prepared by other conventional methods. But what is 3D printing? Well, in 3D printing is a general term that uh, takes into account many different technologies. Uh, there are seven main technologies uh, for 3D printing. Uh, these are material extrusion, powder bed, material jetting, binder jetting, back for photopolymerization. There are seven uh, and they depend in the way that they agglomerate the particles together because we are building an object, added uh, material layers, layer by layer. So depending on how the material is uh, starting, how the ink is, if it's a powder or, or if it's a gel or if it's a uh, plastic material, solid, we have different type of uh, technologies. I'm not going to explain the different uh, types of technologies. Uh, many of these technologies were used in, in pharmaceutics and there are articles around that, that you can read. Some of the technologies are too strong and then they destroy the, the drug if you try to use these technologies, but most of the technologies are okay for this. But as I said, I'm not going to explain these technologies because it, it would take more than an hour, definitely, because it's a, a field that is evolving very fast. So uh, what's the motivation of using 3D printing for making medicines? Well, uh, since 3D printing is controlled by software, it's very easy to change the design of, of this object that we want to create, and we can make it bigger, we can make it with different shapes, we can combine different materials in the same object, and we can create unique dosage forms. So this gives us a lot of flexibility, the possibility of changing the dose for the patients to have a shapes that are more attractive for the patients, easy to swallow, that adapt better, uh, for example, for medical devices with the shape of the patient. We can create uh, poly pills with different drugs in the same tablet, and, and we can create uh, tablets with different drug release. So we are able to, to make unique formulations, unique medicines for patients. Uh, right now, the applications for 3D printing are, are endless. Uh, Everybody is trying to find new applications for 3D printing because it's a very versatile uh, technology. Uh, 3D printing was used for mass production of medicines in US. There is a company called Apricia that is manufacturing uh, tablets uh, by mass production. But uh, the, the main application is going to be personalization of the dose and can be used as an automatic compounding system that could be in a hospital or in a pharmacy to prepare these medicines. Could be used actually to prepare uh, medicines for pets, for animals, because uh, animals, depending on the uh, type of animal, uh, require different doses, different uh, flavors for the medicines. So this could be application. And also in drug development, 3D printing could be used for preparing medicines for clinical trials or for preclinical studies as well. We can make very small batches of medicines. In the future, I imagine that 3D printing is going to be in the space in areas where a disaster happened so, and you need to reach uh, with medicines as soon as possible and you prepare the medicines there. Uh, so uh, many, many opportunities for 3D printing. But uh, what I'm thinking about the future is about the what we call the virtuous cycle of personalized medicine. In the future, uh, our vision is that uh, the, a patient is going to go to the direct doctor because uh, this patient has a therapeutic need either because uh, this patient has a, a wearable device that says that something is wrong or an analytic test, or this person uh, feels bad, uh, has a health problem that, that uh, feels tired or have pain. So this person goes to the, to the doctor, then the doctor, if, if, uh, if the doctor thinks that this can be treated by medication, is going to send a digital prescription uh, to the patient. And this digital prescription is going to be sent to the pharmacy and is going to be transformed into a 3D digital design that can be sent to a 3D printer. And then this 3D printer is going to uh, prepare or manufacture these uh, 3D printed medicines just for this patient because it's personalized. And then this medicine is going to be uh, given or administered to the patient. And then depending on how this medicine works with the patient, 
uh, we continue the cycle, uh, checking if there is still the therapeutic need, if we need to increase the dose, reduce the dose, change the treatment, combine different drugs together. But we continue giving uh, circling around this cycle. And every time we go around the cycle, we are optimizing the, the treatment. That's why it's called virtuous cycle, because every time the patient goes through this cycle, we improve the treatment and we generate new data for, for the patients. Um, so we, uh, as a company and as a researchers, our interest is basically in this uh, 3D printer area, the, this part, and, and how to get quality control of these medicines. So we are also evaluating new uh, quality control methods that are not destructive, that can prove that the medicine is printed uh, correct with the right dose and, and to assure the, the quality of the medicines in alternative ways, for example, using NIR or Raman, but uh, there are many areas of this uh, virtual cycle of personalized medicines that needs to, to be addressed, and we are working as well. Uh, I think di diagnostics are going to improve tremendously. We saw just with the COVID right now that is uh, in just one year, we were able to detect COVID in, in a very easy way. So in the future, we will be able to quantify drug levels in blood in a much easier way. The, the sensors are uh, moving forward and uh, moving uh, greatly, uh, advanced a lot. Uh, we need new software to control or to predict the right dose for the patients. We need new software to control the printer. We need new printers. We need new formulations, new excipients, uh, new drugs that in the past probably they couldn't reach the market. Now they can reach the market because we are going to prepare these drugs or these medicines close to the patient. And I imagine that this whole system is going to be controlled by artificial intelligence software, machine learning algorithms that are going to help uh, to, to make the right decision in each of uh, these steps of the process. Uh, probably you think, well, this is uh, science fiction. This is not going to happen in the next 20 years or, or 30 years. But uh, I, I think we are going to be surprised how this is evolving, because this is evolving very, very fast. Technology is moving forward, and, and people and patients are willing to, to engage with this technology. Um, I, actually, we did a, a study in, where we tried to implement this uh, virtual cycle of personalized medicine. Uh, in 2018, we moved uh, one of our 3D printers to a hospital in Spain, and we selected, we recruited some patients with a rare metabolic disease that is called maple, maple syrup urine disease. These patients cannot metabolize uh, some amino acids in the diet. So they, ha they have to control very tight the levels of these amino, amino acids, isoleucine, leucine, and valine. Uh, otherwise, uh, if they have a lot, they have like um, uh, side effect accumulation of these uh, toxic metabolites. But if they don't have enough, they, they, the patients, mainly children, they don't grow. So what they need to have is a very controlled uh, tight control of the levels of these amino acids. So the standard treatment is that the pharmacies in the hospital, they, they weight amino acids depending on the blood levels and they fill them in capsules. And, and we decide to make uh, formulations, printlets that are two oil formulations, including the amino acids inside with different doses and with different uh, flavors. So we recruited uh, four patients, uh, children from uh, three to 16 year, uh, male and female, and, and we compare the standard treatment that are the capsules that are filled by the pharmacies in the hospital with our 3D printed tablets that were actually printed in the hospitals. And we were measuring the, the isoleucine levels of these patients uh, during the whole process. We tested three months with the conventional uh, capsules and three months with the 3D printed tablets that were printed in the hospital with uh, different doses. And um, th this is the system that we were using. It's a, a type of uh, printer that is called semi-solid extrusion. So we, we filled some cartridges that are similar to syringes uh, inside the printer. And, uh, and then we selected in the software the right dose. And basically what the printer does is to extrude these cartridges to get these uh, chewable formulations. They, they, these are for children. So we decide that getting gummy formulations 
uh, that are more attractive to children would be a good option. And we prepare them with different colors and different flavors. So uh, this technology that we selected is, is one of the fastest ones because we were able to print in 10 minutes 28 uh, printlets, so 28 formulations. So the treatment for one month, uh, we, we managed to print it in, in 28 minutes. And um, you, you can see here uh, how, how it prints. It's an extrusion-based material. But as I mentioned, there are many different 3D printing technologies. And here you, you can see the, the printlets. So the results were very promising. Uh, obviously, we got the, the right levels of isoleucine uh, concentration. When we were measuring the levels, uh, the blood levels of the patients, uh, the levels were tighter control in the printlets compared to the capsules. And this is probably because uh, the printlets were taken alone uh, in fast state. And the capsules, normally the, the parents of these patients open the capsules and mix with the food. So maybe the bioavailability is, is not exactly constant and the same. So we got very similar levels, but the distribution or the dispersion was lower in, in our printlets. We got uh, very good results regarding taste. Some of the flavors like coconut were not very well accepted, but for each patient, we were able to select uh, some flavors like lemon or orange that were the, the better ones for these patients. So these uh, formulations were better accepted than capsules. And that's normal compared, uh, considering that there are children that uh, they, they have to swallow capsules or, or open capsules and swallow these amino acids that uh, the taste is, is very bitter. So we managed to cover the taste. And uh, basically was the, the results were amazing because for the first time we proved that a 3D printed could be in a hospital and we could be able to print medicines in a hospital by pharmacists. And this could be in an automatic way and, and controlling the blood levels of these amino acids in a better way and very well accepted. But also we realized that we needed a, a pharmaceutical printer because the study we did was with a food printer that uh, had some issues and we needed our own software, our pharmaceutical software. Since then, we, we moved forward a lot. We have uh, meetings with the European agency, Spanish agency for medicines, the MHRA, that is the UK um, agency for, for medicines, the FDA. Uh, we got grants to develop a new printer uh, and we have in the market a, a printer that, that we call it a MediMaker that is able to, to prepare personalized medicines using three different technologies and, and everything is controlled by software. So we have a track and trace uh, capabilities. Um, well, uh, many people ask me, oh, well, but well, how is the regulation? How, how you are able to print in the hospital? Well, what we did to print in the hospital is that uh, 3D printed, uh, we went through the uh, compounding. Uh, the study was done in Spain, and, uh, and in Spain is uh, called formulación magistral, but, but it's uh, similar to compounding or, or what is called pharmaceutical specials in UK. And going through that route, we managed to print in the in a hospital, and, and there is no uh, problem to print in a hospital and to do clinical studies in a hospital if, if you go through the compounding route. But uh, 3D printing is a technology that, that can open many new opportunities, and the regulation, I'm 100% sure that is going to change. And, and I said this for, for many years, but I, actually in August uh, this year, the MHRA, that is the UK Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, open a, a consultation on point of care manufacturing. So they are changing the regulation of how 3D printed could be implemented in hospitals. They, they consider, and if this uh, gets approved, that it's going to be a control site that uh, will have control about uh, different locations and different printers in many different hospitals. That is called the, the control site. And this control site is going to control the, the printing sites. So this is obviously not uh, ready and, and is uh, a draft, but it's moving in the right way. And the, the fact that the MHRA is considering 3D printing and the implementation of 3D printing in UK is a good point. And I'm sure that the rest of uh, regulatory agencies are moving in the, in the same way because it's a great opportunity that has 
a bright future, especially for personalized medicines, for medicines that they didn't reach the market yet. So I'm talking about the future. I'm not talking about printing paracetamol. Paracetamol, you can get paracetamol from, from the pharmacy. It's not going to be for most of the drugs. It's going, for, it's going to be for specific drugs where, where there are real needs. And um, yeah, so what we need to keep under control in, in this technology is obviously the hardware, the 3D printer that, that needs to be a GMP printer. We have a, a right software to control the printer and also the formulation that you are going to print with the software and the hardware. So we call this the three cornerstones of 3D printer and need to go together to get any type of uh, regulatory approval. I imagine that in the future, is, this system is going to be like an espresso system where you have a printer in a hospital or in a pharmacy, and you will have cartridges with different drugs manufactured by different companies like Pfizer, GSK, Takeda. So these companies are going to sell the inks. You put the ink in the printer, you select the parameters and you print. And, and I imagine this in the future. And I imagine in the future are going to be one type of printer that is going to print all the medications for many different pharmaceutical companies. But uh, I cannot predict the future, and this is my vision. But uh, for example, uh, Jaime mentioned that uh, he saw an article this morning, uh, and this is something that we are thinking, a proof of concept. Uh, we thought, oh, it would be cool to, to use your phone to print medicines. And there is a type of uh, printing technology where with the light, you can make a solution go from liquid to solid. It's called bat photopolymerization. So we develop a very small printer that we call MediMaker Lux that is able just using the, the light of the phone, uh, you use your own phone, you receive the prescription in your phone and you connect it to this printer and with the light of your screen, you are able to, to print medicines with different sizes, different doses and different release profiles. And this printer is a small, uh, and, and you can see in this picture is a similar size. Th this is actually where I am now in, in my house. And this is the size of my coffee machine that I have close to me and I drink coffee every morning. So it's smaller than the coffee machine. And well, this is a proof of concept. I I'm not sure where uh, we are going to print. I imagine we are going to print first in pharmacies and, and hospitals, and maybe in the future at homes but uh, the technology is there. So I, I don't see any reason why we are not going to be able to print at home uh, soon. And uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for your time for listening to this. Uh, ju just uh, this wouldn't be possible without uh, all our collaborators. We have collaborations with many uh, universities around the, the world, many um, hospitals, many pharmaceutical companies, excipient companies. And this is uh, our team in London that uh, without this team, it would be impossible to get uh, where we are right now. And we have also a, a big team in, in Santiago de Compostela that are moving forward and coming up with new ideas as well. And uh, we are always happy to collaborate and to move 3D printing forward that this is our aim to reach patients as, as soon as possible. And thank you for, for everything. Thank you, Alvaro, for an exciting and uh, excellent uh, presentation, no surprise. Uh, so we could see how pieces are coming together to, to help us uh, pharmacists uh, provide a more convenient and more personalized solution to our patients. Thank you very much, Alvaro. So our next uh, speaker, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce you to Mr. Patrick Van Oishhoff. Uh, he's an owner and managing partner at Good Pharmacy Practice Support, uh, VV, an independent, experienced consulting and management firm, firm in the areas of management, leadership, medication safety, and innovation regarding pharmaceutical services. Uh, Patrick's education includes a Master of Science degree in econometrics at Tilburg University in the Netherlands, and he also mastered executive management programs in supply chain management at INSEAD and leadership at Nyonrot uh, Business uh, University in the Netherlands. Sorry for my pronunciation. Uh, Mr. Patrick Van Oerschot is specialized in a wide range of expertise such as supply and demand, demand change management, closed loop medication systems, digital pharmaceutical care, 3D medicines printing, 
medication automation, organization management, leadership development, entrepreneurship, and innovation. And it is a super big pleasure to have you, uh, Patrick. Please uh, proceed. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. So thank you, Jamie, for this uh, very kind introduction. And it's always weird, like, just like Alvaro said, uh, to hear someone else talk about your, your life experience. Um, but for today, um, I'm going to take you a bit into the implementation of 3D printing. And there will be some slight overlaps with, uh, with Alvaro. But then again, I think uh, in, in the repeating uh, lies uh, to remember all the nice things. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, one back, please. Yeah. Okay. So uh, for today, uh, my talk will be a little bit about uh, the, the why, uh, why for 3D printing. Uh, why do you want to go into 3D printing? A little bit of, about uh, what, because those topics have been covered by Alvaro quite uh, extensively, but I will dive a bit deeper into the why of 3D printing. Uh, and, uh, and let's say, sorry, in the, in the how of 3D printing and what you have to do to bring this into clinical practice. So next slide, please. Uh, as we all know, one side doesn't fit all uh, for clothing, uh, let alone for medication. So definitely uh, for medication, I see a future where we go more and more into personalization. So next slide, please. And instead of having uh, uh, using the old blockbuster model of big pharma companies, uh, I think there is a, a huge role for pharmacies, hospital pharmacies, and uh, also for community pharmacies in personalizing medication. So taking into account the personal needs of, uh, of people. Next slide, please. Personalization, by the way, is something we like to achieve. And this is something we like to avoid that people still are crushing tablets to, to make doses individualized or even a split or quarter medication. That is something which I do not recall as um, uh, personalized medicine. Next slide, please. So 3D printing is definitely a technology which uh, can and is in use for personalization. Um, it has been with us for uh, quite some, some, some time, some decades already. I think the first uh, uh, clinical use was about around the 90s and also in pharmaceutics, I think we can go back to early 10s, 2010s to find the first examples of 3D printed medication, by the way, in more or less laboratory uh, settings, so not in clinical use. Next slide, please. And as one of the, the, the gurus in medical uh, science and medical applications and innovation says, Bertel Meshko, he says uh, the 3D printing of drugs is somewhere at the left steep uh, slope of the, the life cycle. So definitely we are going to hear a lot from it uh, even today. And if you look at tomorrow, it will be even more. Next slide, please. So perhaps a little bit of a recap, but uh, so why use 3D printing? Uh, on one hand, definitely for, for better pharmacotherapy, making dosages more specific, uh, making them more precise, uh, and tailor, for instance, uh, release schedules. On the other hand, uh, uh, to, to get the patient more and more involved, uh, so to increase the compliance, adherence, and concordance, if you want, by uh, ease of administration through uh, easy or fast swallowing, uh, by patient-centered uh, design, or even to convert uh, uh, intravenous uh, uh, pharmacotherapies into oral uh, therapies, which is more easy to use. Uh, for instance, when a patient goes uh, to the home situation after visiting a hospital. And in, uh, in geriatrics, we can definitely imagine polypills uh, to be used. But also there are some opportunities which lie in the economics, uh, as, you, as you might remember, uh, Jaime uh, introduced me as an econometrist, so I always like to look at the business case of uh, these kind of technologies and applications uh, to, to reduce, for instance, the cost by uh, less use of expensive APAs that would be, APIs that would be definitely a, a, a goal to strive for, and insurance companies and payer organizations definitely will have, a, have an interest in this. Um, you can uh, ease uh, and lessen the cost in processes and in, uh, in product development. That is perhaps more for the pharmaceutical companies. And I know one of them, Merck, is definitely using 3D printing in their first and second clinical trial uh, uh, development stages. 
and there are some other opportunities and if we think of uh think out loud I, I guess there will be many many more if for instance uh, uh, the drug shortages are not on the api but on all the other things like production sites then perhaps we can bring back uh, printing uh, from Far East back to, to Europe, for instance, and try to print a medication here. In trial medication, definitely 3D printing uh, it has a good opportunity and use uh, by personalizing drug tapering or titration, uh, and good um, uh, opportunities. And I think decentralizing production bring back uh, some old core businesses back to the pharmacy, being at a hospital or a community pharmacy. Next slide, please. So uh, coming from the, not from the technology point, but from the need point. So where are needs for uh, 3D printed personalized medication? Uh, I name, I think three, uh, pediatrics is the usual suspect for printing uh, small or small dose or precise dose uh, um, uh, personalized medicines. Uh, geriatrics so with a polypill is definitely a candidate. Uh, and in oncology, I see a promising future that's definitely where the, 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 the thin line between uh, uh, efficacy and uh, toxicity is quite, uh, quite narrow. So definitely or oncology is an application field for 3D printing. Next slide, please. So just a little bit on the what because Alvaro already covered that. So I want to mention that, uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, with the formulation form as an oral dispersal film, you can definitely uh, print quite well personalized medications in all kinds of uh, um, uh, formulations and designs, uh, having it uh, in a centralized way, having it dot by dot, having printed, for instance, barcode, uh, where the barcode ink is made out of an API, which I will show an example of later. Uh, but if you want to go into uh, higher um, uh, dosage forms, uh, so let's say above 20 to 40 milligrams, you have to go to other technologies like 3D printing. Next slide, please. And there the uses can be in varying in size, of course, in, in, in perhaps with that uh, in dose, in geometries, in the amounts of infill or the infill patterns, uh, all to create something which is more suitable for an individual uh, patient. Next slide, please. And one study in 2015 uh, uh, showed us already that it is definitely possible to have an application for a 3D printed uh, uh, a tablet where, uh, in this case, uh, uh, three uh, APIs are combined into one uh, tablet, uh, making it easier for patients to, uh, to, to, to swallow instead of having three, uh, just, just having one. Of course, the combination of which of those APIs do fit together uh, from a, a therapy uh, point of view and from a technology or from, from a formulation point of view is critical. But that is something uh, that definitely is going to be into, into development and already mentioned also by uh, Alvaro. To make it a bit more visual, perhaps the next slide, please. Uh, here we see some uh, uh, examples of a 2D printed film, where in this case, uh, the blue ink is uh, the actual ink with uh, the API in it. And you can use uh, the, uh, in this case, a Q QR code, for instance, for uh, patient information or for, identif for identification, for, for instance, bedside verification. You see some very small pills or tablets which are easier to uh, to swallow for for instance kids or people with swallowing problems you can vary in color of course you can separate uh, the different layers in poly pills by color or make them uh, all in in just one color to not show patient spots the differences between them for, for instance for clinical trials etc and I was mentioning, uh, bring it to clinical practice. Uh, so it's not only about um, uh, printing and formulating the medication, but also how to bring it to a patient. So you never bring a, a loose tablet to a patient. So something like the packaging is something that uh, uh, also has to be included, either being it in a, in a hospital pharmacy setting for in the production site, being it in, in a compounding uh, center or for instance, in a, a community pharmacy. So not forget, and this last step uh, in packaging the, the 3D printed medication. Next slide, please. Um, the technology already uh, exists for quite some time, but still the, the good manufacturing uh, machines are quite new, quite young. 
So perhaps not reaching up to the highest speeds. Uh, let's say uh, you, you use about five minutes for, for a tablet. I guess uh, for, for technology and innovation, it speeds up to two and a half minutes within one or two years. So in the end, this definitely will um, bring uh, something that is usable for uh, personalized medicine. But uh, in current state, you have to be smart and, uh, and uh, I think of things like parallelization of, uh, of the printing to, to make it a, a usable setting in clinical use, which is of course a little bit different than use in laboratory settings. Next slide, please. Uh, often I get a question of, okay, but what, what API can we 3D print? Um, then looking at the literature, this, this is something I identified early this year, already 166 APIs are somewhere in a study being at the laboratory study, and not all of them, of course, in clinical, in clinical practice, but more than 166 are already in use. And um, a colleague of mine already said uh, about 70, 75% of all oral medication should be, uh, be, should be able to be printed in two or 3D. So I guess the question is more not what can I print, but what do I need to print? Um, next slide, please. And currently in the market already since 2015, we have Spritam by um, Prusia, uh, which is indeed not a personalized uh, uh, 3D printed formulation, uh, but something uh, that disintegrates fast and is uh, quite useful for a specific um, specific patients with epilepti epileptics. Next slide, please. Another um, uh, FDA approved or going to be approved uh, formulation will by, by Triastec. So this should be the second one FDA approved. And although, uh, for instance, the uh, Spritam by Apricia is already uh, since 2015 on the market, I think what they did is uh, they opened up the acceptance, for instance, by the uh, uh, clearance, uh, clearance organizations like the FDA. So uh, bringing, uh, bridging the gaps or, uh, uh, of things can, that can be printed. On the other hand, I must be honest, uh, I had expected to, to see a lot of more of those uh, formulations uh, on the market. Next slide, please. Um, the studies are found early this year, cover about 24 countries uh, worldwide, I guess in five years time, the whole world map uh, will be blue. And I think many, many research sites, hospitals, compounding companies are into these new technologies. Next slide, please. Okay, then uh, a bit on the how. So that's a bit of the core, uh, what I do in professional life, uh, bringing these kind of innovations into practice. Next slide, please. So to say, to bring them from a laboratory setting into clinical practice and some things, let's say conditions that are needed for this is you have to have a digitalized uh, a process from um, diagnosing the patient until perhaps also the administration of the patients. Seems to be a fair deal, but still there are here in Europe countries that are in the middle of digitalizing uh, the, the pharmaceutical care chain in the hospital and in the home care set setting. Uh, we have to uh, be able to work with all these data sources um, in a secure way. Alvaro mentioned uh, artificial intelligence. I will go come back to that in the next slide. Stop, not go to the next slide, please, but that's something I will cover in the next slide. Uh, the 3D printing uh, can be done, as we already mentioned and, and seen in literature, uh, but what can be done not always has the highest value to, to, to be done. So you have to look at what brings the highest value. So value-based healthcare is something that really uh, is needed, to my opinion, um, and definitely going into things like uh, patient-related outcomes. So what does it bring a patient? It's nice to have a new technology, but how does a patient get better from it? Now, please go to the next slide. So the use of AI um, is, a, is a step uh, uh, above, uh, let's say, uh, already existing clinical rules where you take to in, in, into account many patient characteristics. And the AI can be used uh, in diagnosing, of course, eh? okay, which, which is the indication for the patient, which kind of pharmaco pharmaceutical therapy are, am I going to use? Um, if so, can we, uh, which patients should we include in, include in trials, for instance? 
uh, but also by during uh, the actual practice of prescribing, we can use uh, AI supported clinical rules, for instance, saying that this would be the ideal opportunity to switch uh, from the intravenous uh, uh, therapy to an oral therapy, either by patient convenience, either by economics, because the oral solutions are mostly less expensive. And if you combine it also to the, to the logistics, uh, let's say the, also the last mile towards the, the, the patient, I think uh, there lies a bright future for, for AI in pharmacotherapy. Next slide, please. Uh, since I'm a kind of a process-oriented guy, also I like to look, okay, but what are the stakeholders uh, we have to take to, uh, into account? Of course, a patient. Uh, if a patient doesn't accept this new bright uh, personalized pill, uh, nothing will happen. So you have to include the patient, also the ones that are treating the patients most closely, like the doctor, the nurse, the pharmacist, and perhaps also the caregivers. And next in line, or in circle in this case, are the IT companies, because you have to steer it by, um, by, by software. I guess in the early stage, now it will be dedicated software produced by, for instance, uh, printer developing uh, uh, companies. But in the end, it has to be in the AD electronic health records or in the pharmaceutical systems. The pharma industry has to cooperate, either being it that they want to 3D print themselves or providing the market with uh, uh, APIs for inks and uh, for um, uh, filaments or powders. Uh, you, have a log you need a logistical chain. Uh, for instance, if the community pharmacies are going to 3D print again, uh, you, they will be provided with machines and inks, uh, which is different than only by uh, uh, boxes of uh, medications. Uh, board of directors, uh, they have to approve in this stage uh, uh, still high cost uh, projects, otherwise it doesn't run. And in the end, uh, the legislative bodies uh, have to approve uh, these kind of new technologies. Politics has to, uh, will come in uh, to invest or to innovate in these new technologies. And in the end, the paying organizations like insurance companies, uh, they have to find some kind of a DRG where it says it makes sense for this patient, for this indication and treatment to use a 3D printed tablet. Seems easy, but uh, 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 from practice, I know this is not an easy job. Next slide, please. So uh, in my experience, I could take you uh, in, 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 in a journey uh, of how to bring this into practice when you never have looked at it, uh, for instance, uh, out of today, you can say, ah, tomorrow I would like to go into 3D printing due to this uh, uh, webinar. And you can look at the literature, what is already available in, in, in printing. Uh, you need people around you that are also believers in this new technology, otherwise it doesn't work yet. Uh, you, we have to switch from uh, what is possible from the technology to what is needed from clinical practice, form a team, uh, the team I just mentioned in the stakeholder analysis. Uh, you have to have the suppliers around you, providing you with machines, inks, uh, software, etc. And then uh, construct a project proposal, not an easy job, but something that has to be done, uh, into which, in which you take into account the scope of the project. Is it just the formulation or you want to include already patients? Then you will have to, have to set up uh, the lines for API and excipients, do the development or the formulation. Uh, you have to think of things like compatibility studies uh, for the inks and filaments and for substrate developments. Next slide, please. Then you start with uh, the, the actual printing, not in a clinical trial, but first uh, in your own laboratory. Think of packaging because you cannot bring a loose uh, printed tablet uh, to, to the patient. You have to take into account that inspection for GD, GMP, GDP, uh, or GAP for the automation part uh, are all in the clear. Then you install your final hardware, do your software, of course, uh, make sure your GMP approved, uh, do some stability testing. So how long does your uh, printing formulation uh, uh, last? And then it's into operations like operational sources, uh, sourcing, approval, funding, of course, uh, and from funding, uh, which is more project-based to reimbursement, which is more operations-based, handed over from your project organization into the operations. And of course, then uh, uh, you have to publish and make the world uh, uh, know what you have done uh, to celebrate this uh, glorious moment.
Uh, I always keep this last one in mind because during such a long project, uh, there are always some difficulties you have to cover and uh, stamina is definitely something you need. Next slide, please. So to recap a little bit, so if you want to bring it to the practice, what do you need? You need a project mandate, uh, you need a business case, someone has to approve uh, for the money spending in, into it. Uh, funding can come over funding organizations uh, um, or, for instance, uh, for, um, through partnerships with uh, other hospitals or with suppliers. You have to have your organization in place, so the ones that do the technical parts, the, the IT persons, the ones that talk to the doctors and the doctors talk to, to the nurses. Your supply lines have to be uh, uh, right and, of course, uh, someone has to say this is approved. Next slide, please. And then when you think you've had it all in 3D printing, you can also add an extra dimension uh, to it. Next slide, please. Um, by, by changing the morphology, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, making the pill interactive with external stimuli like a light, temperature, water, or the pH. Next slide, please. And a nice study uh, performed by Geisrat and Basit, uh, Basit in 2018 showed that you can combine a, a, a formulation with something that is uh, uh, interactively in the body uh, uh, altered, so the fourth dimension, uh, to ensure more drug traverse uh, into uh, the small intestine. So a great study. I definitely recommend this to, one, to the ones that are looking into the future of the future. Next slide, please. So what would I like to have you take uh, take home to, to, to tomorrow? Uh, 3D printing uh, definitely facilitates uh, paradigm shifts into war, towards uh, pharmacotherapy in personalization. Uh, we are only at the beginning of the, the curve, uh, but it's not a future 10 years away. I think uh, it's more or less tomorrow or next year. I think the possibilities are, are endless. Uh, of course, obstacles also. So therefore you need the stamina and a good team. Uh, but to my opinion, 3D printing is now ready uh, to become into clinical practice. Uh, but it doesn't come naturally, so uh, uh, it is like people like you and, and, and us to make this happen. And I, I wish you all the luck with it. Uh, for those who want to read uh, about it, I have the last slide uh, for some literature, which is just a small uh, portion of what is available in the market. And now it's up to you, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Again, a very exciting presentation. Uh, uh, you presented us uh, very interesting specifics, not only the reality of 3D printing, not only the future, but also the future of the future. And I like that very much, especially that example of how 3D printing can help us uh, help patients with uh, such simple issues as trying to split their medicines. Wow, yeah, I have not thought of that, thank you. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Jan uh, Sevels, who I've had the pleasure to know for, for a few years. Uh, he's a pharmacist uh, by training. After obtaining a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences, he started working for the Association of Pharmacists in Belgium. Belgium. For the last 10 years, uh, Jan is managing the association scientific department that focuses on the scientific development of Belgian community pharmacists with a few successes, which I've had the pleasure to, to read uh, lately. Uh, with a team of 15 pharmacists, the department offers various products and services that help Belgian pharmacists in their day-to-day -day operations and are an example for other pharmacists from other countries. Uh, thank you, Jan, the floor is yours. Uh, please proceed. Thank you, Jaime, Jaime, for this nice words of introduction and it's a real pleasure for me to share some of our experiences on the occasion of this FIP technology forum uh, very good initiative initiative from FIP by the way um, I will share some examples with you for in order to understand the choices we have made let me tell you a little bit about the organization I work for in the next slide you will read what APB stands for is the Association of Pharmacists in Belgium. We are the National Federation of Independent Community Pharmacies, and we represent most of Belgium independent community pharmacies. You can read our mission. It's mainly about supporting and developing the community pharmacist added value to the benefit of the patient's health. And we're a mid-sized organization, about 120 persons. 
local, localized in Brussels, Belgium, and about one third of this staff is working or employed by our laboratory. We have a uh, medicines control laboratory with a long standing uh, history and experience in post marketing quality surveillance of medicines. And it can be branded medicines or compounded medicines. So we've talked about personalized pharmacotherapy or previous speakers. Um, it's not something new, it's something we as pharmacies, pharmacists have been doing for decades. Uh, it's pharmacy compounding, producing medicines within the pharmacy premises, close to the patient, and make producing medicines adapted to individual needs and preferences. Of course, producing is one thing. We're also pharmacists, so we're dispensing, we accompany the, the patient, and we dispense it with pharmaceutical care. And it's always been, and it will still be in the future, an alternative to manufactured medicines which are produced by other means, GMP production, on a more or less one-size-fits-all scheme. Although there are, of course, exceptions where different sizes are available for patients. Production is done far from the patient, is standardized. The only thing in common with compounded medicine is it's dispensed to the patient with pharmaceutical care. So looking in, co in compounding, the next slide, you will see well, this is something that I state that pharmacy compounding in the year 2021 is still popular, very much needed in my country and hopefully in your country as well. It's needed in different sectors, community, hospital pharmacy. And something I've noticed, I'm not that old, but I still have a few decades of experience. Techniques have evolved over time. When looking at, at sterile compounding, uh, Techniques, machinery, equipment used today cannot be compared on how sterile compounding was done 50 years ago. And the same goes for some types of non-sterile compounding. For instance, for, for semi-solids or for cutaneous preparations, we have excellent weighing scales, balances. We have semi-automatic mixers, which allows to produce standardized quality. Next, please. Uh, next slide. These are, well, what about solid oral dosage forms like, like tablets uh, or capsules? Um, the photo on the, on the left hand side of the slide is something I found on Wikipedia. It's about 100 years old, this photograph. And although the balances, the weighing scales that this pharmacist uses compared to the, the weighing scales I am using today, for sure, they have evolved. But basically, weighing powders mixing them in a mortar uh, with a pestle and mortar, and then somehow filling it over uh, different dosing aids like capsules hasn't evolved that much over time. I did my studies back in the 1990s of last century. I was using these manual capsule fillings and today people are still using the same ones or well, maybe the, the material or the size have changed, but it's basically the same way oral, solid oral dosage forms are produced in pharmacy. What about pharmacy compounding in Belgium? Well, we have a lot of pharmacies, 4,700 of them, and they all compound. And I could add to that all hospital pharmacies in Belgium who also compound for their patients every day. No surprise, it's a particular focus of APB to do quality control of compound medicines. And we even got the FIP attention back in 2020 when a specific program we had in place to quality control compound medicines was a winner of the uh, Pharmacy Practice Improvement Program Award. We were very happy by that. So this came to, to a question we asked us, if 3T printing of solid oral dosage forms could be a valid alternative to the classical pestle and mortar preparing. In other words, can printed tablets or caplets or printlets be an alternative to filled capsules? And we started a research program almost two years ago with a few Belgian universities, Leuven, Ghent, and Liège. 
Next, please. Um, we are not, I'm not, I'm not working for university. We are a, an application focused organization. So we tried to start this project with the end in mind. The end in mind being, if we're going to develop something, it should be to the side, it should be to the side of, to the size of the individual community and hospital pharmacists. That's why quite rapidly, we chose for one particular 3D printing technique out of the seven that Alvaro showed, which is fused deposition modeling. The reasons why we chose for this technique is because desktop printers are very much available and they are affordable. I wouldn't say cheap, but they're very affordable. They're easy to program. They allow flexible sizes, geometries, dosing. And in theory, they are cost and time efficient when used on a small scale. There's some disadvantages of using FDM, meaning, and namely, you need double extrusion. You have an extrusion step in order to prepare drug loaded filaments. And yet you have the actual extrusion process on the moment your caplets are printed. There's a very, a very big influence of the polymers that I use it to make those filaments. And the choice of the polymer or a polymer mix is very crucial. You need to study all mechanical and thermal behaviors of the polymers, of the polymer mix, and of the drugs within that polymer mix. Just lastly, as a scenario, we don't see filament production within the community pharmacy. These are industrial or semi-industrial processes. So typically, drug-loaded filament production would need to take place outside of pharmacy. What about another thing, looking at the end of the process? What would you swallow? Uh, we've seen cylindrically shaped um, tablets, uh, but patients are not very accustomed to see these cylindrically shaped uh, tablets. So we did some experiments with different geometries, uh, just using off-the-shelf polylactic acid um, filament, which you can just buy in, in any 3D printing store. And we just played around with different geometries until we got one geometry, which mimicked to a big extent the bigger classical paracetamol tablets you would find in any community pharmacy. And then tr just tried with the few first test we did was with a model compound, theophylline, um, a filament with, made with the HPC as a polymer and 20% theophylline. We started printing the, these tablets um, using the shape, the geometry that we thought would be acceptable uh, to patients. It worked quite well, and as you can see in the next slide, we played around with these with these with these tablets printed twenty in a row, and typically looked at uh, parameters you would look at when preparing twenty capsules and doing quality control of them. Which means, well, for this, for instance, we were looking at how did they look like, what's the the length, width, height, or other, what's the size. Uh, to, can we produce consistent size of the printlets? We also looked at how the, unif the mass uniformity of these printlets were, and we saw some differences between large printlets and small printlets. Uh, typical, another typical parameter to look at, as you can see in the next slide, is not just mass, but also content. Of course, when you produce for a patient, you want exact content, and if you make you're going to print uh, numerous uh, doses. You need to have a constant, uh, uh, constant content, of course, of the of the printlet. And this is just uh, a test we did by liquid chromatography, looking at ten individual printed tablets and just looking at the dose and seeing if they're right uh, within the specification of a content uniformity test, which it did, by the way. Um, Size is one thing. We've looked at uh, mass distribution, content uniformity. In the next slide is even a more critical test, test, which is in vitro dissolution. Of course, you want a product to be released 
when it's swallowed. And we've tested some tests. This is, again, the HPC theophyllin. We can see the solution. It's quite slow. It's not ideal, but at least it's reproducible. So we, we can control more or less the production of our printed tablets. Um, we then looked at different variation in the filament. In the next slide is shown how we tested for robustness. As I said, we think our scenario is that these filaments are produced on a semi-industrial way. They find their way to the pharmacy. So we need to have constant conditions to print with these filaments. And we did different tests, um, storing them at different temperatures, these filaments at different temperatures, different humidities, and see what, how the, print, the printlets turned out to be. Custom-made filaments also needed to have constant diameter. In the table, you can see just two different batches of filament with tiny differences in filament diameter, uh, only 0 0.05 millimeter difference, but still looking at the content of these, cap of these uh, printed tablets, you can see a difference. There's about uh, uh, five or 10 difference, percent difference in, uh, in content. So these are all theoretical or applied um, examples. In the next few slides, I will show you some, some real life examples, some, some pharmacotherapeutic applications, uh, areas where we think that the 3D printing can make a difference for pharmacists and for patients. And I've brought with me today two examples. This is the first one. And again, like, like Patrick and, and, and Alvaro said, um, in the field of pediatrics, there's a lot of possibilities. We were looking at uh, children with adrenal insufficiency or congenital adrenal hyperplasia, where the standard of care, so I've been told, is hydrocortisone replacement therapy with a very careful titration uh, regime in order to control androgen access and optimize growth and development of these children. So you can see the range of different dosages that would be needed for these patients. Unfortunately, there's no existing pediatric license formulation in Belgium. And yes, we can compound, uh, we can compound capsules, but correct dosage is critical in order to avoid putting these vulnerable patients at risk of poor disease control and possibly an adrenal crisis. And what certainly does not help in promoting compounding for these patients is publications like the one uh, I've shown the reference there. It's a German. Um, it's a publication by some German research a few years ago where they showed substandard quality of compounded hydrocortisone low dose uh, therapy. And even by visual inspection, you can see that this is really bad compounding practice. Next slide, please. So we thought when we were approached by uh, a group of uh, pediatric uh, endocrinologists in Belgium to find a solution for these poor patients. And so we start a research project, project with the Liège University where they were, where they were trying to use fused deposition modeling uh, with hydrocortisone loaded polymer. The results, unfortunately, I cannot show you today. Uh, they look uh, promising. Uh, watch out the socials that as Jaime uh, suggested to see some publication in the next few weeks about this very interesting and uh, fascinating um, application. Next slide, please. Fortunately for, for all of you participants, there's another uh, application where I can show lots of results. Uh, we're not into pediatric applications anymore. We're now look, looking at adults long-term benzodiazepine or Z drug users. Regrettably, Belgium is amongst the top users per capita of these products, whether they are used as 
uh, hypnotic sedatives, or even used as, as uh, sleeping aids for insomnia. Looking at insomnia, we know that lormetazepam and zolpidem in the Belgium setting are the most popular ones. Popular between brackets, of course. Um, for the pharmacists present in this webinar, um, unnecessary to say that long-term use comes with its side effects and it's very worrying. And there are different risk mitigation or strategies or health policies uh, to make sure less people are dependent on these benzodiazepines. Um, first of all, make sure they don't start with the therapy or they don't st if they, they start a therapy, it will never become long-term, but only short-term. But for people who are already for months, years, and sometimes, dec sometimes decades on these products, gradual dose reduction is preferred over immediate stopping because immediate stopping gives a lot of side effects, rebound effects. And there are different schemes uh, for gradual dose reduction. And I've added a few references where you can read about these uh, dose tapering uh, schemes. Again, as in the case with, with hydrocortisone, there's very limited licensed formulations on the market, which brought us to the idea um, of checking if FDM could be a valid alternative. And the timing of this webinar is just perfect because this paper was published, I think not more than a week ago. It's in, in pharmaceutics. And I will share the link in a few second, minutes in, in the chat or in the Q&A to, to this paper, um, mainly by Mrs. Henry from the University of Ghent, from the team of Professor Vervaert and, and a few of her, uh, of her colleagues, where they, um, where we tried to develop a dosing platform um, to aid in zolpidem withdrawal therapy. Because this is the, the compound we chose, zolpidem, which is amongst the top two of the benzodiazepine and Zedrac uh, consumption. Next, please. Next slide, please. So typical, what you will read in the paper if you read it, is um, zolpidem, it comes as a hemitartrate and first step of developing um, a dosing platform is to characterize this API. And you can read all these fascinating techniques like TGA thermogravimetric analysis, difference, differential scanning telemetry, some microscopy, spectroscopy. I'm not at all an expert on all these, but if you're into these techniques, please check the paper and you read all the results uh, of the physical chemical characterization. FDM means double extrusion process. So first step, preparing a filament, which is done by, by a twin screw extruder. Um, and you can read here the different brand names of the polymers that were tested. And not just polymers, but also polymer mixes that were tested. To have better results, also tests were done by adding disintegrants to this polymer mix. And you can read the, the brand names of these disintegrants. And then the, the, the machine you see, you see there is the twin screw extruder that was used at different temperatures in order to prepare a 1.75 millimeter uh, filament. I immediately go to the, to the, the best results of the study, um, meaning the a mix of EPO-PEO, which are two of the polymers that were tested in a 70-30 ratio, gave the best results in terms of mechanical properties and low hygroscopicity, which favors the zolpidem stability. And that this polymer mix was blended uh, with 1% and with 2% of, of the API. Then 3D with this filament, 3D printing uh, was done, different settings of a 3D printer, but the most standard uh, printing conditions were with a nozzle at 160 degrees. And then just one of the parameters, uh, which gave nice different uh, photographs is just a small nozzle size of one 0 0.25 and a larger nozzle size of, of 0 0.60, which gave a less detailed uh, uh, result. And then the typical 
tests were done, as I showed in the uh, as an example with the theophylline, looking at caplet weight, dimensions, qualities, and so on. You will find all, everything in the, in the paper if you're really interested in all the individual uh, details. I just brought, next slide please, one particular um, result, which is of course a dissolution, I've talked about that uh, for, for theophylline. Um, this is the dissolution profile of the low load and the high load. And you can see the, the results for the 10% um, API. The dissolution rate is faster, but still the, the USP, the, the pharmacopoeia limit of I think more than 80% release in 15 minutes is still not, not met. Which leads me to the next slide where you can see some strategies to enhance immediate release. Uh, for instance, channeling is just programming some, some channels, as you can see in the picture, which showed to be ineffective. The addition of disintegrants, there was only marginal improvement. That was also tested already. And another strategy, which has not been tested yet, is the addition of soluble fillers as pore formers. So still some things to do to optimize uh, the solution profile. And lastly, apparently after uh, polymorphic transition, the zolpidem is self-sensitive to photolytic degradation, which means one way or another, we would need to, to film coat uh, the printed tablets or immediately protect the finished caplets from the light, for instance, in this, this aluminum blister. These are sort of challenges would that come up uh, during the experiments. So in, in a conclusion, in my, my last, last slide, uh, I think, Desktop 3P printing, if you find the correct application, can be an alternative to classical compounding. The FDM um, we have been using with double extrusion, apparently we struggle with good release kinetics and maybe we should change to other techniques. Uh, maybe if Alvaro can lend me uh, a Fabrics MediMaker, we can, we can try other techniques. Um, of course, none. One polymer fits all. I'm convinced that uh, other APIs will need other polymers, uh, meaning a lot of research needs to be done. But all in all, it's, it's a fascinating field uh, of research. And to, to finish up, I'd like to acknowledge all the people who did the hard work. And you can read the names over there and I probably forgot a whole bunch of them. So that's all for me. I give the floor back to, to Jaime. Thank you, Jem. An excellent presentation again uh, from a 100-year-old picture of a colleague compounding that speaks a lot to us to a very modern service of dose reduction. That's very practical and I like that very much. So I would like to invite all of our speakers to open their cameras and I hand it over to Jacqueline who will um, uh, uh, manage the Q&A time until I can give the conclusions at the end. Thank you very much. Well. Thank you all of you for your fantastic presentations. I, you're just bringing us to the future and it's so interesting and fascinating, I must say. Such presentation has been very stimulating and we have a lot of questions. So I will just go uh, through uh, some very practical questions first. Uh, there is a question which is the use of uh, 3D printing implies that the user of it should have all the drugs to manufacture the personalized medicines. Who would like to answer this question? Uh, I, I can reply. So, so uh, yeah, obviously um, the 3D printer is not going to uh, generate the drug. You need to have the drug before as a ink. Uh, there are two options. Uh, one option is that the drug is mixed with some materials in the pharmacy, and then we go through the route of compounding, and we use the 3D printer as an automatic compounder. And then uh, we have the other option that you get some cartridges that uh, is, could be the cartridge uh, as a syringe, or could be the filament that Jan was uh, mentioned, or could be other type of material 
that incorporates the drugs and excipients. And then this is what is used as a ink to print. So bo both options, but obviously uh, it's necessary to have the drug before. Uh, maybe in the future, there are some studies where people are actually synthesizing drugs using 3D printing. And this is a completely different topic. Uh, it's a way to bring in back the production of these drugs to, to close to the patient as well, and maybe in the space to do this, but this is a completely different topic. So we need the drug first. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, a, a question which is also very practical uh, is about the end of the cartridge. How could it impact the dose accuracy? How do you manage this? It's very practical. Well, uh, what we normally do is we know when the printer is going to stop because uh, everything is controlled with software. So you can just, when it's going to finish, uh, all, obviously we, you lose a bit of material in the middle and then in the nozzle, but then when it's going to finish, you just replace with another one and you continue with the printer. It's, it's quite a standard technique, I would say, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I should have guessed so. And, um, Another question is, uh, is there any limitation with the 3D printing capsules as per dosage and age of patient? I don't know if Jan or Patrick want to reply, probably has more, they have more experience in capsules and, and sizes and patients. <laughs> Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really see not, any. Not sure. I know the limitation of, the, of the, uh, the, the, the oral films. If you want to use them in a practical way, you can go up to 20 and, and 40 milligrams of an API. But I know that for a 3D printed tablet, you can go up much higher to one gram. But um, I don't know what the limit is. Sorry. No. Um, I, I see now other questions which are more on the uh, final product. Um, there is a question about the quality control and about the dissolution behavior of the final product. Who would like to answer that? I can, I can if you want. If, if we see 3D printing as in my presentation as an alternative to classical compounding or automatization of the compounding, I would probably use or bring forward quality control techniques that are used today by pharmacists in community and hospital to quality control whatever medicine they produce, which are rather limited uh, techniques. Um, you can have visual aspects, you can have um, the size, the mass variation, but often uh, looking at, into content and dissolution, the destructive methods. So maybe some semi-automatic non-destructive measuring technique, as Alvaro showed, would be the right compromise uh, as a quality control technique for compounded medicines or printed medicines. Thank you for this answer. Thank you. Um, I see another question here. It's about the, uh, the difference uh, between uh, a manufactured product and the uh, product which is prepared uh, with a 3D printing uh, technology. Uh, it's about uh, the difference and also the price difference. I'm not sure it's an easy question to answer this one. Who would like to uh, at least give some information? <laughs> I, I can try, I can try. Um, well, there's no such thing as a standard price of conventionally manufactured formulation. There are very cheap tablets around and there are very complex injectable biological products around. If we, come, if we just look at the classical small molecule, um, high throughput tablets by compression, probably 3D printing will be much more expensive if you go in to look price per per printed pill. Um, but if you compare to individualizing treatment for a particular patient, then maybe 3D printing can be cost-effective because there's less 
uh, time spent by a pharmacy technician or by, by a compounding pharmacist, you can gain some cost efficiency on that point. Uh, perhaps I can add to that. Uh, if you, for instance, have a medication therapy on oncology, uh, which is started in the hospital, but if the patient in the home care situation can continue with an oral 3D printed tablet, not having to come to the hospital, so total cost of this treatment will be much lower. So perhaps the, the pill or the, the printlet itself is more expensive, but the treatment is, 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 is less costly. So I think that's a way to look at uh, this new, the use of this uh, technology as well. And is there a difference in formulation between uh, conventional manufacturing and 3D printing? <laughs> That's another question. One of, one of my of the, the ones who have uh, printed the, the pills themselves. I, I don't know. Yeah, well, th there are differences beca because the, the process is different. The type of materials that are used uh, are different and uh, the knowledge that you require is different. So I would say that there are differences because uh, it's, it's a new field that is necessary to, to educate people, first pharmacists, then clinicians and, and patients as well. Good. So um, another question is, uh, what is currently the roadblock in implementing printlets in clinical practice? I think probably uh, everybody can say something <laughs> because uh, so, yeah. uh, we are working uh, in the right way. A couple of years ago, I would say technology was not almost there. Uh, now I, I think technology is there. And a couple of months ago, so I would say, well, regulation could be a problem, but now regulation is going in the right way. So I think it's just, uh, from my point of view, is a willingness to do it and, and money, because it costs money at the beginning to do some clinical studies. Uh, for me, uh, what is difficult sometimes is to find the right clinicians that want to do these studies. And whenever I found them, I, I, I don't leave them. I just want to marry them and, and work with them because that's difficult and it's, it's, it's just hard work and you need to do it and, and get these medicines ready. And it's going to be done for sure. Uh, I, I don't think there is a roadblock or this is my impression right now, but uh, I would like to know the opinion of, of Jan and Patrick. What is ADA asking, for instance, to approve these products? Do we know? This is another question. <laughs> well, well, FDA has already uh, approved Spritum uh, and is working, if I read the, the Patrick slides correctly, is already working on another product. So uh, I think they're basically looking at it as any other marketing authorization, except that the technique to produce the medicine is some, somewhat different. Yes, of course, mm. and according to the country, of course. Um, there are questions about um, how affordable and how applicable could it be for the patients in developing and underdeveloped countries? I don't know if... That yeah, well, um, my opinion is uh, could be a, a technology that could be implemented there, but I think first you need to implement it in places where you have access to uh, the right power supply knowledge. So I, I don't think it's something that can be implemented uh, better or faster or easier in developing countries compared to, to countries that are uh, let's say more technological or have more knowledge. That's my impression. But if we find the right niche application for, for something like that, uh, the technology is not extremely expensive. So it could be uh, adapted, I guess. Yeah, that's very precious to know that, yeah. Um, well, there are some other questions coming in. What kind of dosage form can 3D printing make instead of tablets? Well, I think the presentation has already answered that. Who would like to put some more information on this question? 
I think, uh, uh, let, let's say, a smaller medication can be made, uh, medications that are more attractive looking, uh, for instance, for pediatrics, better taste, of course, is something uh, that, uh, that can be made. I think the release and so different release schedules uh, incorporated in the design of a printlet is something uh, of high interest. Uh, we have the oral dispersible tablets, uh, the one of Appresia, for instance, uh, that disintegrates fast. The same for um, oral dispersible films with swallowing problems. So you don't swallow a, uh, a tablet, but uh, a film which dissolves within 10 to 15 seconds into your mouth and then is already incorporated. Also useful for people with swallowing problems and for children, for instance. Um, I think if we uh, uh, discuss this a bit further, we can find more of those uh, kind of applications. But always it starts with some kind of a need from, from the patient, to my opinion. Um, another question is about the cleaning process between different products. Do we have a, an answer for this? Well, I think this is related to a pharmaceutical printer. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the pharmaceutical printer needs to be especially designed for easy cleaning. So the parts that are in contact with the drug should be removed and cleaned, uh, washed with water and, uh, and be stainless steel or Teflon or uh, materials that are approved for contact with drugs. So this is not a problem. Obviously, if we are using a printer that is not designed for pharmaceutical products, it's a problem. Okay, and uh, I see time running, so I will allow a last question. It's about the availability of uh, uh, the printers and uh, uh, the applicability in community pharmacy and also in hospital pharmacy. And uh, it's true that in hospital, maybe tomorrow, uh, we will have a, a, a printer in your backpack and then you go uh, in the different wards and you print just uh, as it is required uh, um, a, a, a tablet or a pill or printlet uh, according to the dose for the patient. So is, that, is it applicable for that tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> could, could be an option. Jacqueline to, to do it to it that way, but we could also just have one good printer in the hospital pharmacy and print different dosage forms in these printer or printers and then dispatch on the different wards. There's maybe not a lot of added value to have different small prints on the different wards. I'm not, I'm not sure. There's, there's a lot of uh, added value in that. Well, technology shows that the printers may be reduced in size, so you may have very miniature printers that could allow that, maybe. Maybe. Well, we, we, we are really in the future. Well, yes, Patrick, you wanted to add something. Yes, definitely. Uh, in my country, we see a development towards uh, um, uh, the hospitals taking care of patients, not being the patients in the hospital, so taking care of the patients at home. Uh, so treating the, the treatment starts clinically in the hospital then, but will be continued in the home situation, also for uh, oncology uh, treatments. So therefore, I could imagine that either the hospital pharmacy prints, of course, all the medications for the patient in the hospital and for the patient at home. But a cooperation between community pharmacies and hospital pharmacies makes, makes more sense, to my opinion. For instance, if the patient lives quite a far distance from, from the hospital, that the, 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 hospital pharm the community pharmacist takes over the, pr the, the production of the tablets. So it, it opens up also something boundary breaking between uh, hospital uh, pharmacies and community pharmacies. Perhaps it's a more vision than reality, but I guess uh, we should move in towards this direction. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much to have taken us in the, in the future, at least in our mind. And I will turn now to, uh, to Jamie for the conclusion of this webinar. Well, thank you very much, Jacqueline. Uh, just my very personal conclusions, uh, if they're useful to you. So 3D printing can be the next step for compounding of medicines, which has been very relevant for the pharmacy profession and patients for centuries. It has many applications that open the door to new processes and, uh, and uh, solving uh, problems as disasters, 
space missions, clinical trials, shortages, uh, specific patients, as it has been discussed. Regulation is definitely going to change and we should be ready for that. There are many different technologies that will keep evolving and improving and reducing the size of printers, as Jacqueline very well said, in my opinion. And it will be part in the end as uh, a part of the full digitalization of the clinical process from the di diagnostics of the patient using uh, technological tools to the follow-up and in the middle of, co of course, deep production by 3D printing in many cases. Uh, we have to start with the specific projects, uh, having the patient in the end, having the patient in mind, even for uh, things as small as the uh, size, color, and shape of the products. And uh, we discussed today not only the future of the future, as Patrick said, but also the reality that is, that is happening. And we need to be aware in pharmacy profession of all these new um, uh, technological uh, developments as the FIP is doing, especially with the technology forum under the leadership of Jacqueline. This was all from me. Thank you very much, uh, especially to our panelists, Jacqueline and FIP staff, who is uh, behind the curtain, uh, ensuring that everything, the process is smooth. Thank you very much, Cassandra, Mila, and many more. And thank you all for being with us today.